Yeah, welcome back uh, to The Breakfast. The conversation continues right now, and uh, it's about coronavirus. The pandemic is still raging, raging uh, worse and worse. I mean, the NCDC just announced 1,354 new cases across the country. But it seems there is some light at the end of this tunnel. The federal government is saying that uh, they're going to, they're actually in talks with uh, the Chinese government for the procurement of vaccines and that the president has approved the establishment of an oxygen tank in each state of the federation and as, as well as uh, five other tanks that are not working would be fixed. Mm -hmm. And to discuss uh, you know, this, this whole issue, we have with us our guest. He works with uh, the Mutala Mohammed uh, Foundation. He is uh, Okpeyemi Orinowo, coordinator of medical assist program of that foundation. Thank you very much, Mr. Orinowo, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, tell us, uh, first of all, how would you assess how the federal government has been handling the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, at the very best, I would say the federal government has been reactionary. Uh, we've not seen the kind of uh, proactive response that we would have been expected to, to tackle such a pandemic uh, as COVID-19. So we've been always after the fact, you know, trying to play catch up in, in most of the scenarios that were, that were witnessing, both at the, at the, at the start of, of the situation and even now that, you know, we still have more information. The government has been very reactionary and, and that's not really the best uh, approach to, to handling this. You know, I mean, like you've said, reactionary. Uh, we've waited this, you know, long before, uh, of course, putting our foot down with regards oxygen tanks across the country. Um, your, your quick thoughts, you know, on our health infrastructure in the last decade um, and how, you know, this might be evident that we lack so much with regards to infrastructure in healthcare. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, from, for, for us, uh, part of the reason why we even the foundation established the Medicis program was, I mean, before the advent of COVID-19, we're dealing with a situation where for uh, I mean, if you look at the doctor to, to patient ratio in Nigeria for a population of over 200 million people, we have four doctors to 1,000 people. I mean, that is way below any benchmark that you would want to, you know, compare us with. I mean, in the UK, we have about 28. In the US, about 26 to 10,000 population. So definitely we had a insufficient manpower to be able to handle with our, our, our population. So there was there's definitely that deficit. And part of the reason why we are established MedAssist right now is to see how well technology uh, through telemedicine can perhaps address some of these issues that has to do with uh, um, personnel providing care to the very uh, marginalized low-income communities across the country. So, I mean, the pandemic has further, you know, emphasized some of this uh, uh, crack in the system uh, as far as service delivery is concerned. And it's requiring us right now to really, you know, rise to the occasion and look at how we can put together an infrastructure to address this. I mean, it's unfortunate to know that before now, we didn't even have a, a pandemic response policy or issues around preparedness for this. You know, I, mean, I know that it's, it's the same across a couple of other countries across the continent, but now the government is seeing the need and, and I'm aware that maybe the NHIS right now started to put some kind of conversations into place to bring stakeholders towards, you know, country developing some kind of pandemic response system. You know, so part of the things also that we're witnessing has to do with information. We're dealing with very illiterate population in terms of people's understanding. I mean, COVID as it is right now is still politicized. You still have conversations of people not being sure if COVID, COVID even exists or not. You know, so these are part of the significant issues that we have when you're dealing with uh, a demography, a demography as such as Nigeria. At the initial stage, uh, I had a conversation on one of this um, one of the other TV stations, and I was saying the initial approach the government tried to take to this to run a centralized system of, you know, through the presidential tax force to try and address the old, all Nigerians as if, you know, we're all just one homogeneous entity was a great mistake. There are some people who it is only their kings, the kings in their immediate locality, that's the only person they listen to, you know, so you cannot decide to now say you want to create one national system, you know, so it goes back to our approach to quite a lot of things. You know, so for us at, at, at MedAssist, those are part of the things that we're trying to do. I mean, we've deployed a system now that's, that in which you can talk to doctors in Igbo, Yoruba, Aosa, and Pidgin English, you know, okay. regarding men mental health and as well as specifically handling COVID-19. You know, so these are part of the things that we'd expect that ideally the government should be able to, you know, you know the mindset that should drive the way in which you want to address issues such as the pandemic. And, and yeah. we who at the foundation right, has taken the pool by the own to decide to set up such a system. Okay, I mean, I mean, let me, let me interrupt you there. <laughs> let me interrupt you there quickly to say I, I definitely agree with you when you talked about not, you know, 
having a segmented response. Yep. Because even in developed countries, you see countries like the UK having different responses for different sectors, different parts of States the country, also. not just one yes. general response because you need to mm -hmm. address it, you know, tailor it. So now the president's back to the main issue. He's saying there will be 36 new uh, oxygen plants in each state of the country. How soon do you expect this to be a reality considering, you know, the Nigeria that we know it? And uh, how do you think this will help us in tackling COVID-19? Okay, absolutely. So um, how soon? That, that would be a very difficult question for me to be able to tackle, to say how soon, going by government's approach. But if you go by the award, I mean, the president has, has said that, that is, is going to be a bit low. But I think the ultimate question would be that, yeah, that there, is, there are different approaches. I mean, the approach of, uh, of waiting for people, I mean, if you're going to create an oxygen tax across the country, I understand that you're trying to envisage a situation. But what are we doing even as regards prevention? I think there's a lot of emphasis that should even go around in enlightening the populace to understand. I mean, the best way to handle this situation is still prevention, not treatment. We do not have the capacity to be able to say, okay, in a situation whereby we have as much as 1 million or 10 million people right now who are down with COVID, no matter how many oxygen tanks you're able to set up, and we only God knows when this will eventually be put in place. You know, so I, I think there's a lot of emphasis that still has to go with prevention to see how well people are enlightened, immediate care people can get. You know, because if you look at 200 million people, how many oxygen tanks do you want to set up? Yeah, can each state handle up to 20 or 50,000 people per, per state with, who are down with COVID and need oxygen tanks? So it's important to have an holistic approach to, to handling this issue, really. All right. And um, also the um, information, you know, about COVID uh, that has been spread. You know, there's uh, people who would say that, you know, there's still a lot of misinformation with regards, um, you know, our testing and what we truly are dealing with. Uh, the second wave apparently is seeming to be more, you know, dangerous, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. than the first wave. Um, how do you think, you know, we also must tackle that, uh, you know, and of course also find ways to improve on our testing uh, to, you know, get clear, better clarity on what we're dealing with? Absolutely. I mean, speaking of the testing, I mean, for case in point, how much does it cost to test people in Lagos? 50,400. What's the uh, uh, standard? I mean, what's the... What's the uh, um, Minimum What's wage. What's that income bracket? Uh, minimum wage, you know, of, of Nigerians. So let's do that analysis to see the, the number of people who eventually maybe develop symptoms to be able to treat themselves. You know, so that gives us a rough picture to say that we're not taking that realistic approach. And like you mentioned, if the second wave is more potent uh, than, than the first wave, it means that the risk on, on people right now is high. I mean, and with what we're even saying across now, we're saying that we're not testing enough. So those numbers even that NCDC is putting out as, as daily... Uh, numbers are not really the actual reflection of how far the, the virus right now has penetrated uh, uh, the, the populace. You know, so it's it's really a, a very unfortunate situation, and, and it brings me back to some of the things that I believe the government needs to be investing in, which is platforms such as how ours that the Muhi Talib Mohammed Foundation has put in place to see how can technology help, how can we ensure that this information gets across to people, how can we you know have toll lines, free toll lines, in which people can access healthcare from the corners of their home, just be able to pick a phone. You know, already there's, there's constraint around movement. So, so how can we use technology right now to deliver this service in the language people understand, and perhaps even for free? We presently run the line for free. If you want to talk to a, a medical practitioner regarding COVID-19 or mental health, you know, just, just calling the line alone uh, uh, allows you to be able to speak to a medical practitioner in any of these languages to get consultation for free as far as COVID-19 is, is concerned. We also provide referrals. For testing, yes, offer, yes, Mr. Uh, okay, we, 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 we do understand the great work you're doing at the foundation. Uh, but bringing it back to, to, to back to base, the federal government now says it's in talks to provide uh, just how many? 100,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine by the end of January. So are you excited about this news? And uh, what do you think? Because I've seen, you know, skits, so many skits on TikToks, on Instagram, on WhatsApp, you know, people making fun of just how you would react react when you get a COVID-19 vaccine, mm. that you begin to act weird, oh, you know, like no, you're being controlled. Just, you know, so yes, are you excited those. about the vaccines? And what do you think, you know, uh, just like Clay Mohammed has said, that Nigerians might be skeptical about taking them, even if they're provided for free? Absolutely. I mean, I am excited, you know, because at the end of the day, the vaccine right now provides a window of escape, you know, for us to eventually beat this virus. But the other thing is, just this morning right now, I was reading on, on, on news, I think it was the news reported by Punch, 
that we had a couple of biologists, Nigerian biologists working for our institution, coming out to say now that you know they don't think the vaccine right now is the is the best approach. That perhaps right now we still have a chance at herd immunity, immunity right now for the populace right now to be able to fight the virus. So we do have the, the conversation around that is okay. And and what is the number? Hundred thousand? For is that is hundred thousand going to be enough? What I mean, so I can already tell right now it's going to be the elite who would eventually you know, be the first set of people to benefit from all of all that. You know, so it's, it's. I mean, I don't know how to feel. I don't I, I don't know if I'm happy because at the end of the day, there's not going to be equita equitable access to that vaccine as it is. So that, those, those are my thoughts really on, on, on the vaccine at the moment. All right, Okwemi Orino, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, we, of course, are looking forward to speaking with you again. If we have uh, follow-up on these discussions and seeing how these oxygen tanks are set up across the country. Thanks uh, for your time. Thank you. Wow, Thank you indeed. Yeah. Very, very important conversations about health. I mean, what is wealth without health? We do need to be alive to enjoy the good and finer things of life, Absolutely. right? And uh, let's now talk uh, further on uh, the World Bank, COVID-19. They're predicting that uh, uh, extreme poverty uh, and, and depression would hit economies in Africa because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have an economic analyst, Mukta Mohammed, joining us just after this break. Do stay with us on The Breakfast. <laughs>